When did you last check your phone? And did you spend longer online than you planned? Under 25 year olds spend an average of six hours a day online, mostly on their phones. Older groups spend less time online, on average 4.7 hours. That's according to new research from the University of Surrey in the UK. What are the signs of internet addiction and what should you do about it? Also on the show, more and more companies are using software to monitor their employees' performance. Is that okay? And could we soon get better drugs and better computers thanks to research and production in space? These are the topics that are moving the tech world. Why? No, I don't want to. Do you get angry when asked to put your phone down? Social media, shopping and online entertainment, even scrolling through the news, all of those online activities can affect your brain and that can become a real life problem. When does being online become addictive and what can we do about it? But first, how can the internet be addictive? In a nutshell, excessive usage of digital platforms and gadgets can lead to internet addiction. It can create an actual physical dependence and cause social problems. Everything we do or consume online is designed to be sticky, a nice word for addictive. Social platforms, shopping sites and online games mess with the reward system in our brains. When you're getting a like for an Instagram post, a dopamine rush follows. Dopamine being the feel good hormone. The same is true for that extra life you've been given unexpectedly in a smartphone game or for the sudden discount on the pair of sneakers you spotted on Amazon. The little boosts of euphoria make it more likely that we will engage in these online activities again in the future. When this gets out of control, it can become similar to a chemical addiction like alcoholism, cravings included. Is this really scientifically proven? Internet addiction has been the subject of many scientific studies all around the world. Unlike substance abuse, it is considered a type of behavioral addiction. Internet addiction often occurs in combination with other mental health issues like depression. A recent Chinese study analyzed the internet usage of more than 100,000 young people worldwide aged 10 to 24. The findings? There is a strong correlation between internet addiction and depression. More than 14% of people worldwide show symptoms of internet addiction, according to an earlier publication funded by the same Chinese institute. The Chinese government has proposed a minor mode to limit children's smartphone use to help avoid that. The European Union is also aware of the problem. Members of the European Parliament believe that existing rules are not enough to protect consumers and they call for further legislation. For example, some are saying addictive features like infinite scroll, default autoplay or constant push notifications should be prohibited. The European Commission is currently evaluating whether consumers have enough protection. The results of this evaluation are expected in 2024. Are you addicted? Okay, so if you can, try to answer these questions honestly. Do you often stay online longer than you intended? Do other people in your life complain about how much time you spend online? Do you often say or think just a few more minutes when you're online? And do you sometimes hide how long you've been online? If you answer these questions with yes, that still doesn't necessarily mean you're addicted, but you might wanna keep a more careful eye on your own online behavior. For most of us, it is simply impossible to live without the internet. We depend on it for work and it's the way we communicate with our friends as well. Here are three ways to beat the cravings. Monitor your overall screen time. Identify how much time you spent doing what and ask yourself, how much time do you want to invest in each online activity? Nudge yourself. There are some useful apps that can help you reduce your screen time by nudging you to switch off. In case you have the feeling your internet usage is getting out of control, the organization Internet and Technology Addicts Anonymous is offering free online meetings in nine languages the tech AAs will even connect you to a tutor. And if you think you suffer from depression and anxiety linked to your time online, please seek professional help. Your employer can digitally track nearly everything you do while working on a company computer. Programs that are used for this can even assess how productive you are. Employee monitoring is on the rise worldwide, but do we really want that? 
The U.S. government wants to find out if tools for monitoring employee performance pose a serious risk to workers. So which tools are we talking about? And could you be a victim of productivity paranoia? Since the beginning of the pandemic and the rise of remote work, companies seem to have an increasing interest in keeping a digital eye on their employees. Close to 80% of bosses in the US use monitoring software. That's according to a study of 2,000 employers and 2,000 employees working remotely or on a hybrid schedule. And 73% of managers store recordings of staff calls, emails or messages to evaluate their employees' performance. According to a Microsoft poll, 85% of leaders say that since their teams have been working from home, it's harder for them to trust that everyone is working productively. This has been labeled productivity paranoia. But how can software really help with this? And what is it capable of? Employee monitoring software. Well, to be honest, it can track nearly everything. Most programs record keystrokes or mouse movements and track computer activity by taking periodic screenshots. Other software records calls or meetings or even assesses employees' webcams. The programs can also enable full remote access to a worker's systems in real time. Some developers also offer linguistic analytics tools. Employers can choose to receive alerts if their employees search terms like interview or open job search sites. There is also recognition software that can track employees' attitudes by analyzing facial expressions or voice. For now, this is being used in sales, but the possibilities are endless. Do we need regulations? In most parts of the world, it's legal to monitor work devices as long as employees give their consent. But beware, most employees are not aware that they have consented to surveillance. To find out if you're affected, check the fine print in your contract or ask your union representative for help. Employee surveillance has already been the subject of several court cases. In late 2022, a court in the Netherlands ruled employers may not require their employees to turn on their webcams all day while working remotely. The court considered this a significant interference with the private life of the employee and a violation of basic human rights. But should individual courts decide what's allowed and what's not? Right now, the US government is planning to take action. They want to find ways to regulate the use of monitoring technology. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy has called for employees to share their experience with monitoring software. While they see positive sides to this kind of software, they also see workers' rights as being endangered. Monitoring conversations can deter workers from exercising their rights to organize and collectively bargain with their employers. And when paired with employer decisions about pay, discipline and promotion, automated surveillance can lead to workers being treated differently or discriminated against. How users trick the system. On social media, users show many creative ways to trick monitoring software. For example, they attach a battery operated tool to the computer's mouse to keep it moving. This way, the time tracking system will record activity. Do you think it's fair to have your boss check if you're really working? Or do we need more regulations? Let us know. Medication and microchips are being developed in space. Why? And why should we care? Because it might mean a cure for diseases and better computers. Low gravity and other conditions enable the development of much faster microchips and better medication for diseases like cancer. Does the future of medicine lie in space? Space medicine. Well, there's a lot more to research up there than 3D printing using moon dust, a trick that NASA astronauts performed in 2021. Carrying out experiments in space allows scientists to study and produce medication without gravity. The unique environment is almost a perfect vacuum and has higher levels of radiation. These conditions could lead to results that couldn't be achieved on Earth. That means we could get more effective drugs in the future and maybe even new ones for, as of now, incurable diseases. That's why US President Joe Biden set aside several million dollars for America's space agency, NASA, to pursue cancer-related research on the ISS in 2024. A low-gravity environment can speed up the development and discovery of complex molecules used in medicines. Misbehaving proteins are the reason for many diseases. That's why scientists crystallize proteins to examine their complex structures. 
In space, this process is much easier than on Earth. Understanding a protein can give scientists a better insight into disease mechanisms. They can identify drug targets and optimize drug design. In the future, that could mean we get drugs that have fewer side effects, are more effective or more resilient to temperature changes. Beyond developing new formulas, it's also more effective to produce drugs in space, or at least parts of them. Molecules generated in space are more stable and can therefore also be larger and more complex. That's why several companies are investing millions to enable the production of more potent substances in space, and then transporting them to Earth to manufacture the final product. Better computers thanks to low gravity? Low gravity research could also give us faster computers in the future. Semiconductors are the brains of most of our electronics in the form of microchips but their development has stagnated in the last few years. The main components, typically silicon or germanium, simply have limits in what they can achieve. In space, we have a much better chance of optimizing the structure of these elements. There may even be the opportunity to generate complete new materials that can make computers faster. Some experts assume semiconductors made with materials generated in space could be up to 10 or 100 times more efficient. How is this supposed to work? In fact, none of this is really new. There have been experiments on the ISS for years, run by academics, government agencies, and commercial customers alike. But access to the International Space Station is very limited, and the interest is continuously growing. That's why big private space players like SpaceX and Blue Origin are investing in commercial space labs that are floating in low Earth orbit. But there's also new startups like Varda Space Industries in the US or Spaceforge in the UK that are trying to tap into that market. So researchers and developers could get the chance to come up with some real innovations in the coming years. And private space enterprises might prove us wrong about being nothing more than an expensive hobby for the super rich. Do you think production in space will lead to the next industrial revolution? Or are you skeptical? Let us know. That's all from me today. Goodbye and see you next time.